So we're currently being live streaming now. So just give us a couple of minutes. Uh, if you're wondering, what is this session? And what is this random set of people here? Uh, you're actually currently logged into massive data processing in, Do in Adobe Experience platform using Delta Lake. So like I said, give us a couple of minutes uh, to get ourselves all set up and established. We're live casting to both LinkedIn and YouTube. So that's being set up as we speak. Um, meanwhile, why don't you tell us uh, where you're based out of? Where are you from? Um, my name is Denny, and I'm based out of the Evergreen City, um, and I'm IE from Seattle. I'm super excited that Geno Smith got resigned. So yes, for Seahawks football. So I had to toss that a little bit in. Yes, why don't you go ahead and kick, uh, kick us off here? So I'm Yash. So I'm from San Jose. Well, right now it's sunny and nice. I don't know how it'll be one hour from now. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Actually, how cold is it right now in uh, in, in uh, San Jose? It's pretty cold. Well, I'm from India, so for me anything is cold. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least for me, it's like I'm wearing a hoodie inside my house, so it's cold. <laughs> okay so what what temperature are we talking roughly like uh, for you because is it like is it still like i was about to taste t talk in celsius i just realized okay no in, in in fahrenheit like are we talking like you know 50 60 degrees or like I'm right curious. yeah i think it's what right now like around 46 yeah oh okay okay we're actually roughly the same temperature right now actually so yes yeah, so i get I, I get i guess you're a little chilly fair enough all right cool enough all right so how about everybody else that's on the line why don't you tell us where you're based out of uh so you, you hear yes just from san jose myself from seattle why don't you chime in while we uh finalize the uh, logging in linkedin and youtube and it looks like uh it's being set up right now Woo! all right i think we're good to go excellent all right, well, then let's start the show. Oh, we've got somebody from Spain, from Pedro from Spain. That's awesome. We have Goral from Brussels. Oh, I love Brussels, by the way. A uh, huge fan of that town. Uh, hey, hey, Pedro, you said you're from Spain, but whereabouts? You're from Barcelona. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just curious. Anyways, uh, uh, oh, from Valencia. Nice. Okay, that's pretty sweet. Okay, uh, let's start off the show. So just to provide context, we are currently live casting on the Linux Foundation Zoom. Uh, we're also uh, on the LinkedIn and all, Delta Lake LinkedIn and the Delta Lake YouTube. So today's session is massive data processing uh, with the Adobe Experience platform using Delta Lake. So saying that, I actually want to have Yesh introduce himself, uh, provide a little background. So want to tell the audience who you are and um, yeah, actually, how did you even get into the data engineering space? Like, you know, you can even go back to college if you want to. So <laughs> Sure. So I'm Yeshwan Vijay Kumar. I'm currently like an engineering manager at Adobe. So I started off, uh, I think all the way back to college and so on. So I started off as a machine learning engineer doing churn prediction and stuff with Ericsson. Then was building machine learning models for ads at Yelp. And then I moved to Adobe. Then I became all things distributed systems, like distributed data databases, distributed computation frameworks. So kind of became a generalist kind of started off from the machine learning side because how do we get data into the models, right? It's in for us to build the models. A lot of the times, most of the time is probably spent trying to clean up the data or trying to get the data in the right way. Building the model is much more easier. The time you spend for the pipeline is probably much, what's much lesser than what it, you spend on the data side. So that's how I got into the data space. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. Actually, I want to go backwards a little bit because I don't know this about uh -huh. you. So, so uh, for, for starters, completely grok you from the ad space of models because I was actually doing a very similar thing. I actually, um, this is going to age me now, but I <laughs> actually w helped with some of the display ads with Bing initially mm -hmm. when we were writing Perl scripts to go ahead and process <laughs> data. Okay, so exactly to your point, we we're building models. Uh, we were using God knows how many different programs at the time. It's even worse than what you think of it as now. Um, we would go ahead and then use Perl <laughs> to go ahead and actually try to do d our data pipelines. Um, and yeah, like exactly to your point, like you, you start off like, you know, trying to do machine learning models and then you end up spending the vast majority of your time for data cleansing, data pipelines, just making sure the data is even in a, at a point where you can actually generate the actual model. So I'm just curious, like when you joined Yelp, like was, were you 
actively fighting that process or did you just finally like just like me gave up and like okay i'm going to become a data engineer now no actually so you have had a very good uh infrastructure setup i think a lot of smart folk has set up a lot of things so i was a so i hated uh java I still hate Java. <laughs> I do a lot of Scala. Okay. You, you, yeah. can, you can still continue hating it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think no, I'm in a no, safe we're not, we're, No judgments here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I still, I, I love Scala, though, by the way, so that before sure. any pitchforks come out. Uh, so Yelp had this amazing thing where, like in Ericsson, we had a problem where we had to set up our own clusters, right? Like we literally set up a data center, a mini data center within the office to try to simulate some stuff. At Yelp, sure. they were full AWS. So there was a lot of EMR going on, but still to write the, the goddamn job, you had to write it in something, right? So Hadoop in Java was not exactly really good, but Yelp had this system called MR job. I don't know if it's still there. It was basically a Python wrapper on top of Hadoop MapReduce. So it, right. you, you, you get to write Python, right? So okay. you, all the stuff was in Python. Uh, so that was amazing. So you're still doing all the Hadoopy stuff, but it was in Python. So of course, sure. perf wise, it's going to be there. But then when you have so many thousands of cores to throw at it, who cares in a way? But of course, the AWS bill will care, but it was good <laughs> uh, from exactly. that point onwards, right? But then as you go out, uh, it's not as structured or uh, data, as in the data teams were not as invested in, um, mm -hmm. I would say, even eight years back. Uh, right now, you see a, a much larger focus on that area. Um, but yeah, but getting to the question, right? At Yelp, at least I didn't have to do too much of a thing. A lot of these things was set up for me. But when I got out of Yelp, that's when I kind of noticed, oh, okay. So this is not something that's common everywhere. Uh, so that's, got, that's what got me into it, right? So to say like, okay, I need to actually understand what's happening from an infra level, from a storage level. Okay, somebody's not going to solve this for me. I need to go and understand what exactly, how the data is stored, what the data is, uh, and how can I get it the, the more in, in the most efficient way. So that's kind of what I say was my inception into the whole data engineering space. Got it, got it. So you, you did this in Yelp. You, that was your introduction or inception into it. And then you joined Adobe, right? So why don't yep. you tell me a little bit about the, what is, for starters, what is the Adobe Experience Platform? Why don't we just start with that statement? Uh, okay, that's... Uh, I would say, uh, not, not the first, but then um, it's a completely organically built uh, platform, uh, okay. which is focusing on getting uh, the user data or the marketing data or like first party data, second party data from the various uh, customers that are there. So for, for us, for example, uh, like Target could be a customer or Nike could be a customer, like, and then they bring their data into our platform. They assimilate it using the unified profile to make it into one single profile, which is the team that I work with. And then they're able to create experiences using that data to, what do you say, make ads? Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, ads drives the world. Uh, but then, or even more critical experiences, right? Like the emails that you get, like say from your airlines, uh, saying like, right. hey, I'm targeting you for some points or right. anything like for discounts, et cetera. So a lot of these daily interactions that you take, a good amount of them flow through the Adobe systems, particularly the Adobe Experience Platform. It's all the gotcha. way from data collection, assimilation, as well as like, you know, weaponizing your first party data. Right. Into exp into customer experiences. That's kind of what the Adobe Experience platform is about. Right. So basically, it's that it's all about that personalization and recommendation. Right. Correct. To be able to go ahead and take that information, combine it with other pieces of information, so that way you can personalize which whichever customer you've got can personalize specifically Correct. for that for their users. Gotcha. Okay. Exactly. Well, then why don't we start with what was it like when you first started? with the Adobe experience platform, like in terms, because it, it didn't start with Delta Lake. I mean, we got there, which is great. Obviously right. I want to talk about that, but before we talk about how we got to Delta Lake, and for that matter, why you, you're using Delta Lake, why don't we start off with like, what was it like before? What, what was it like when you joined? Like, what, 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 were, what were the, some of the inherent problems of the system? So quite a few, right? Especially when you're building something, like when you join an already mature uh, product or a team, 
it's much different, right? A lot of the groundwork has been put in for you. In the in the case of AAP, this was being built from the ground up, right? Sure. So a lot of the stuff had to be like best practices or even infrastructural best practices had to be laid down from the beginning. So with respect to the challenges that I personally faced, right? Like trying to get a, like a, even a proper Spark cluster, right? Mm -hmm. We had our own homegrown thing, which was built on top of, I don't know if everyone's on the K8 train right now. I don't know how many people remember uh, Marathon, DCOS, and Mies Mitsos. Uh, so Got if it. you've tried working with that, I, I've, I've self-hosted uh, for one of the teams that I work with, a DCOS cluster. Guess what? It's not good for your hairline. So you can see the, <laughs> the remnants of that, right? Yeah. Um, right, right. Yeah. So, but yeah, so trying to even get a sing, like a simple Spark cluster up, right? That was a problem. And then right. we are primarily on Azure, right? So that was another thing. Um, Gen 1, as in ADLS Gen 1, the data lake Gen 1, that wasn't as in as scalable as what Gen 2 is right now. So that was a different thing. So we had to go discover the issues that were there. But, the, but then in terms of the actual data storage problem, that we that is my team, that is the unified profile team, which is kind of responsible for getting all this fire hose of data from everybody, right? Like every single click, app link, whatever you do is getting fed into the system in real time. So we were initially trying to model it with HBase. And then we moved Ooh. and HBase okay. on Azure, right? There was no the at least whatever was touted to be like a managed service was not a, the HD inside version was not exactly uh, something that you could go to war with. Uh, so we were trying to build that on top of Azure, right? And that didn't work out. Then we moved to a NoSQL store, a managed NoSQL uh, store. I, okay, so actually let me pause you on the, the, the managed NoSQL store. With HBase, were you actually like running your own HBase in K8 or were you trying to like, for example, use HD and something like that to, to run it? First, we tried with HD Insights, and then we basically okay. ran on top of our own VMs, no k our own VMs on top of the Azure premium storage and so on, right? Gotcha. <laughs> uh, so that was a lot of fun, to put it lightly. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, a, a good amount of cycles, tears, and blood was uh, spent on those uh, things, right? But all those were learning lessons to say like, okay, how far right. can we push something? What works? What does not work? Because for every lesson we found out where something is not working, we also found something, okay, these are some good stuff too that we should probably carry on. So yeah. there were some good things that were carried on. But that was basically the state of it, right? When we're trying to build and explore at the same time, uh, there's a lot of uh, is, 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 issues on that front. Uh, but yeah, then storage wise, then we moved to our own managed NoSQL store. Uh, right. And that worked out great, right? Okay. It, in in terms good. of scaling out and all of that, that kind of worked out pretty well. But managed NoSQL stores on any cloud, they're going to be very, very expensive, right? Ah. You basically pay through the nose. So that's places and then the way that you have to model the data that also is another mm -hmm. thing in, in in the case of our uh, product offering right we are kind of in a very weird space where uh, we also do real time transactional uh, operations like what sure, i say sure. you you have hundreds and thousands of requests per second like which are right. one ingesting data or they're even querying data right so it's like point lookups but yeah, at yeah, the same yeah. time the majority of our workloads are, you know, the Spark based scan workloads. Right, right. So now we can maintain two different ways of doing it, but then, you know, there was no Delta back then. Uh, yes, in, yes, in, yes. In trying to do like analytics. So, or we would have had to build it on top of some data warehousing systems and solutions, which right. in terms of latencies and everything would not have worked out for us with respect to our data backup. So Got we it. basically ended up consolidating, at least in the build phase. To say let's have one store and let's try to do to the best of our abilities like a spark connector on top of the same store but and we'll also do the transactional loads on top of this store now gotcha. that obviously has limitations but i'll stop yes. at that point but that's basically uh how it was when we were building out this entire thing uh and kind of the challenges we were facing yes, 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 yes. got it got it so so in, in a nutshell, from this perspective, then you're about to shift into a solution in which you basically 
a silo chunk of it is, is your traditional like batch processing type, like where like a standard Spark cluster could actually go ahead and query and get you like, you know, okay, these number of people were recommended X or saw these ads or these events occurred or yada, yada, yada. Okay, standard right. stuff, basic event approach, okay? But then you also have this problem where you're going like, I, I need to be able to say like point in time snapshot style queries, which right. is like, okay, right. Because like, okay, I need a recommendation of this particular model, right? And so that's why this split between a NoSQL store in essence initially, and then, yeah. Okay, okay. right. As in, that's so, why so, I just look at it. It's yeah. in, in, in terms of the number of functionalities that go, right? You can just classify it as like a, a scan based uh, system and an analytical right. store versus right. uh, as in a lot of use cases catering to that side versus, right. you know, just a single transactional uh, point lookup kind of a scenario. Right, right, right. Okay, so so then when you went in, like, how did you, before we talk about the actual solution, how did you go about reasoning what would be the solution to the problem? Because, I mean, I think a lot of people here would like to understand, like, how did you get to that point? And, you know, what were the gotchas? Because, the, like, this isn't, this is actually, unfortunately, quite common, right? This idea that you have this scanning query access plan, right? The a la Spark, or, and then there's a hot store type partition planning where you actually have to query these like, you know, uh, point in time query type queries. So how, how did you go about reasoning that? Were you prioritizing one over the other? Did you basically have to treat both as the, as the same priority? I, I'm just curious. So that's a great question, right? So yeah. we had to treat both of the same priority. We couldn't just okay. give away one because in terms of the business offering, what we were trying to give, it was kind of like, first in class and first to market in that uh, right. okay. is in, if you kind of put it in that CDP uh, ecosystem, like we were kind of there before other remarketings or something that was happening. So there was a lot of, um, I would say, push for us to get there quickly too. We can wait for the perfect yeah. solution, but we need to make things work. So right. our priority was, okay, we know we want this. We know we want this and we cannot trade off uh, say like, oh, we're not going to give this for the next one year, like one part of it, right? We cannot do that. <laughs> right, right. So right, right. that takes a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah. we were like, okay, we were willing to take on that architectural debt to say like, okay, right. let's make this work. Let's make, as long as we are spending, uh, what do you say, less money than what we're bringing in, we're kind of okay with it. And let's okay. evolve the, archi let's make sure we have enough escape hatches built in so that we can go get out of this architecture as tech improves and that that bet kind of paid to pay to pay off perfect okay so this is excellent i love your flow so basically you know you have to solve both the hot partition heart store and the batch store at the exact same time you know that basically just as long whatever you do will end up lowering the cost <laughs> so right. you're like you're so you're basically not losing money running the system you, it's a migration path. So it's not like a flip yes. the switch. It's very much a, a pathway between like, we're, you're not even sure what the end goal looks like yet, right? You just right. know that you're going to go ahead and iterate through. This is excellent. I love that piece of advice because a lot of people are always often looking for like, I know exactly what the solution is. And, um, and my user response is like, I can't tell you what the technology is able to do six months from now, let alone a year from now. No, that's the wrong way of looking at the problem. I would love to say that. <laughs> yeah, it would look like I'm a genius, uh, but no, uh, the entire team, right? Because it's not just me. The way yeah. a lot of smart folks in the team, we all came to the same conclusion. Look, we don't know what might be there five years. As in, when we were designing this, there right. was no delta. As in, there was no delta. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, yes, yes. So we didn't know something like that would come. Our, right. as in, in terms of our uh, plan B, plan C was, okay, how can we make uh, our representation of the data more light? Can we kind of optimize on that? And we still knew we, we could make some headway into that. But then okay. you do have like, you know, literally like groundbreaking stuff coming out. It changes right. the equation completely. So that sure. way, that time it makes you look really good. You're like, oh, that's great. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You planned for all along. No, no, you, you, you were, you, were, you were omnipotent. You knew that this right. technology would, would, would right. appear two years from now, and you would magically be able to make use of it. No, so, so, no, no. This actually is a really good lesson for a lot of people because uh, this is what I constantly try to remind folks. Is like, it's like, 
you design things so you can plan for a future that's different as opposed to designing for things that you think are going to happen because more times than not, whatever you think happens isn't going to happen anyways. True. Okay. So let, let's let's talk about those lessons learned. So now you, you, you joined, you have this awesome scenario where you have to actually do two things at once, two competing things at once. Right. Like without, without like, because if we go into the Uber details, this will be five hours long conversation. So <laughs> we only have about 30 more minutes. So look, yeah, why don't we, like, why don't we break down some major milestones like, of how did you get there, basically? Right. So actually related to the previous thing that we had, that actually ties into this part. So one of the okay, escape please. hatches that we were kind of talking about is uh, very early on, right from the V1 of our system, we kind of took an event sourcing design. Uh, okay. which was meant to feed into other parts of the platform because we are kind of the hub at the center of the experience platform, powering a lot of the applications depending on what app it is. So what mm -hmm. we thought was, okay, let's be a bit event-driven so that we can at least lessen a bit of the load on our system. And that okay. probably, that decision that the team took probably paid off the most in terms of the migration okay. or my miles from the other. So what, what I mean by event sourcing in this thing is we have any database, any NoSQL DB that we provisioned, basically we built our own um, CDC or change data capture. So every time okay. a mutation happens to this primary store that we have, single store that we have, it would emit a notification of that change to our okay. centralized Kafka topic. So basically gotcha. think of it as even if you have thousand customers or a thousand DBs, all the notifications are basically fanned in into a, a single fire hose. So anybody who is listening downstream to us knows basically when something has changed or what has changed specifically, like on a per a row level basis. Think of this as the row level change feed on any of the databases that we have, or like in the Postgres side, the logical replication, like uh, you, there are a lot of parallels to this. But what we did is we didn't depend on the database to give us the CDC. Instead, we built our own custom layer. So which okay. means that we have a bit of agnosticity over here to say like, okay, I have a particular data mod mod model. I have modeled all the changes and I have a way to consume those changes in one particular way. So that was the first part. So we before we decided to migrate to anything or move or replicate, we kind of hardened that system to say like, okay, is the replication behavior the same? And then right. now comes the milestones part, right? So now we okay. have the transport layer built in to say like, oh, something changed from the source of truth, which is the current sure. source of truth. Right. So now then we started building the layers to say like, okay, step one, let's just replicate everything row by row, like uh, a mirror of a, the, the data, data that we have. As gotcha. in the advantage of that is because it makes our verification process very easy. Like, we could choose to have a different data model. We could choose to have go completely crazy to say, when we move to Delta, Delta Lake, let's do com something absolutely brand new, which would okay. be great. But then the problem is the burden of truth falls on the team to say like, okay, A equal to B, right. which is not exactly very simple. The, basically that reconciliation thing. process became, right. would become basically gigantically painful to put a light Right. So okay. our first milestone was to simplify that entire process to say like, um, if I have a hundred rows on my left-hand side, which is the source of truth, I'm going to have a hundred rows on my right-hand side. Right. And that what the guarantee that this replication system that we're giving is very simple. We're going to say within a particular time bound that we can measure, we're going to replicate all the rows from A to B. And now this becomes a much more easily verifiable thing through hashes right. and jacquards and stuff like that. A lot of right. statistical processes was built around that to make sure that this replication process is hardened and it's good. And we are continuously investing in that. Right, so this, just to reiterate the point, this replication though is of the changes. So in other words, you, yes. in other words it's not like for sake argument, if there were a billion rows in the source of truth, you're replicating a billion rows. What you're doing is, is you're saying, no, no, I'm focusing on the CDC, the change data capture side of yes. the house. Uh, and I have the verification, you've basically hardened the replication. So that way I, you never have to rebuild the whole system. You exactly. basically only need to grab the hundred rows or whatever it is at that point in time, that time window, that batch window to basically ensure that those 100 rows came across and whatever you do downstream doesn't really matter at that point because you've validated that in fact, the 100 rows that came through first 
those are exactly what you were expecting. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And okay. so that was our first milestone, right? In terms of facing right, right. it out, because we, we wanted to narrow down the problem. Now for the second milestone, right? That we're at doing this thing. Uh, but before, now the first thing was the replication. The, se sure. the second milestone was to get the actual, um, you know, the workloads that are dependent right. on the hot store to move on top of this. Gotcha, gotcha, uh, gotcha. Right? But, but there was a big advantage now because we narrowed the scope to do a one is to one match, right? Like right. every row on LHS equal to every row on RHS. Now the Spark workload in terms, and then for those familiar with Spark, I'm assuming everyone is familiar with Spark, in terms of our reader in whatever df.read we do, we just give a binary compatible a mapping to make the rest of the Spark job think we've gotten the exact same data as we have gotten from the hot store. Gotcha, so gotcha, gotcha. In, in terms of migration, in terms of, so we're not, if you, if you, if you have 10 different workloads, which are dependent on this hot store, we are not rewriting 10 different workloads. One right. team writes the mapping function to make sure the rest of the job thinks it's just talking to the hot store because the job doesn't care. It just cares about what schema you input schema you're getting into in the top of the pipeline. The rest right. of the flow does remains unchanged. So, so, so for 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 all intents and purposes, as opposed to ten different replicas, you're basically multicasting it in memory out. So each of the ten jobs, just say using the magical number of ten, um, <laughs> each of those ten jobs basically is able to access that data in memory, as opposed to being written in storage. Has the hundred rows or whatever number of rows? Or I'm mean, curious. How, how, yeah. So, like, how do you validate? It, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, slightly differently, right? Think of it. Okay. Sure. We, we, we don't need to go into ten jobs. Just think of you have a single job, which sure. reads, let's say, it has a schema of uh, foo comma bar comma baz, right? Just sure, sure, three sure. fields. Yeah. Now that was from the hot store. So whatever yeah. struct schema it was reading from there, it was reading from the hot store. Now when we switch this job over to use the source of the delta lake replica, right. now we need to ensure like. We can do two, op we have two options now, right? We rewrite right. the whole thing. If the right. schema in the Delta Lake is different, we basically have to rewrite this job to be more right. efficient, to fetch it in the correct data, assimilate it in a particular way. Basically a full re rewrite there. The other sure. option we have is to say, just write a very thin mapping function. Sure. To, to make, make sure that the data that's coming from Delta Lake looks exactly the same as whatever it's looking at from the hot store, at least because from a milestone point of view, it reduces right. the amount of friction that we have. We need to get, you know, multiple teams to align on to use the Delta Lake store instead of, because there, it goes, there, there, there are two types of block, uh, I would say blockages that you have. Uh, one is I can say, oh, look, Delta Lake is 10 times faster than reading from the hot store, right? Sure. People will be very happy. But then there's also the human element or the engineering element. Oh, by the way, it's going to take you six months to port your workload to work on top of the Delta Lake. Sure, sure, sure. Right. So right. when you have when the flight has already taken off, mm -hmm. trying to put uh, a complete rewrite solution becomes right. very cost prohibitive. Exactly. exactly. Uh, as in, irrespective of how good the solution is. Yeah, exactly. Be, because the actual development time, the engineering time, the validation time, testing time itself basically makes it a non-starter for all intents and purposes. Right. Right. So that's kind of one of the reasons we decided to do the one is to one approach, the, as in the mirroring approach, and right. then build this mapping layer in order so that the rest of the teams downstream can easily consume the data. And for them, basically nothing has changed. Just right, for, right. So, so in right. other words, you've abstract for the downstream systems, they've you've abstracted away the problem. They don't know they're Correct. querying whatever. It doesn't really matter to them. Correct. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. So basically you've got this hot store, you've placed it into Delta Lake, you've built this mapping functions so the downstream systems doesn't actually have to care, uh, which is great. Is everything solved or <laughs> no, 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 it's <laughs> I'm not pretty solved. sure it's not, right? Exactly. No, 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 so, it's not solved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I figured yeah, so, so, yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit more? What, so, what, so this this gives us the idea of being the extract away and minimize the downstream engineers what they actually had to do in order to be able to query the same data, right? Correct. So this is great, right? So you've basically you've stabilized it, but then and you've made it easy for downstream systems, but obviously there's a whole bunch of other problems. So let, let's get into correct. that now. So if you so now we have to just go into the NoSQL itself, right? Okay. So sure. take a 
any NoSQL store that's there, right? Sure, sure, sure. Has sure, a sure. concept of multiple partitions, right? Yes. So when when you as in and let's look at the sta the status quo. When our Spark jobs go talk to the NoSQL store, the parallelism of the read is going to be proportional to the number of partitions that that NoSQL store right. has. Because exactly. if you have only ten, I I can throw a hundred cores. I can easily. But get you're going to be queue up exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I'm not going yeah, to use you're you're, 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 Basically, you've got ninety that are doing nothing. You only have the ten that actually exactly. are actually doing anything, just because that's the, the. It can each NoSQL store basically can only optimize per the each basically per partition at that point. Correct. You can't have right. multiple threads hitting the same partition because duplication data and yada 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 fun stuff. Yeah. So we actually yeah. got a way around it, right? Just so that okay. Uh, cool. So what we tried to do was okay. Let's try to get a cursor on each partition. Let's do sub partitions, okay. right? Let's do sub partitions, oh, okay. right? So now you'll think like, oh, you did sub partitions, great. So now you have twice as much or N times as much as right. capacity as it is there. Oh, but stop, by the way, the more sub partitions that you do, which means that you're doing more things parallelly, which means right. you're going to incur more cost because of right. the, in terms of higher concurrent operations that are going to happen. Right. So yeah, yeah, so we solve the, the time problem by parallelizing it. Oh, but guess what? We have to pay through the nose and years in order to actually get the functionality that we need. So right, right, now right. it was like, okay, fine. We found an engineering solution to it, but not necessarily a business solution. A cost solution, exactly. Right. Yeah. Basically, it starts getting prohibitively expensive because any NoSQL store, as soon as you go ahead and basically says, okay, I'm gonna knock up the, my concurrency, my ability to do concurrency, the cost is just through the roof at that point. Right. Yeah, agree. The second problem that we had was just because of the data that we have and the volume of the data. It's sure. like what every Spark developer has, right? Like sh shuffles, right? We have to yes, assimilate sure. data. Uh, we yes. have to assimilate data at a profile level. Like, like for example, if yashatgmail.com is one profile and I have a bunch of events associated with me, I could also have 6311234, which is my phone number, and some right. e e e events associated with that. So right. when when some action, some personalization action is happening on me, the data has to be combined from across both these individual fragments before right. a decision can be made. Right. Because if you don't include it, you're going to have wrong, what to say, logic getting fired in the downstream system. But yeah, sure, sure, sure. the problem was shuffle. So if we, if we were to characterize it, shuffle was a problem. So these were the okay. two main problems that we had. So okay. now comes one of the points that you were saying, right? With the CDC right. approach, we basically had an incremental handle on top of what changed. Now, sure. with just the raw Delta Lake mirroring, we basically increased our read throughput, right? Sure. Because the data stored in Delta Lake, in terms of compression, we see anywhere between 10 to 15 X compression from what we store in the, this, this, this one. So our read performance has gone up because more partitions, more core usage. But then right, the right. other important part was our main workflow, which is assimilating these profiles. So now we are doing this on an incremental basis. So now Delta, Got it. because you have the change feed and all that stuff that you're going to put right. in, in terms of like only when the commit happens in a particular right. table, is it going to, the change feed is going to be there, which basically serves as a notification for another system that we have to say like, okay, incrementally materialize whatever you have. Right, right. It is not possible, right? It, as in, I wouldn't say not possible. If you throw enough money at something, you it is possible even with the hot store. But right. then the the problem trying to do a materialization like that is because there are like multi-level joints that are happening across Spark and a NoSQL store. So now you right. can't exactly plan a query like this. Right. right, but then now what happens? The materialization, whatever the incremental materialization that we're doing, is within the same Delta Lake universe, right? Right. So like Parquet, Parquet. So in terms of Spark, it knows exactly how to optimize this incremental materialization pretty well. So right. the change feeds. So Delta, of course, thanks to Parquet, we get the compression and all the statistics and everything. We are able to do the replication uh, much more efficiently, but then. Because of change feeds, it enables us to do incremental materialization. Right. So that solves the second problem that I was talking about. Okay, um, got it, got it. No, th that's actually really cool. So basically, you're able to leverage CDF, the change data feed, for basically solving that second problem. And then it also solves technically part of the first problem because the cost of it 
the read hits are actually no longer on the NoSQL store. They're actually on Delta Lake. And because it's all a bunch of Spark queries anyways, it's not that big of a deal for you. Basically, right. yeah, it, it, some of it's cached in memory all on its own anyways. If you have to query, run multiple concurrent queries, it doesn't really matter. It's hidden off the Delta. Just like you said, you're actually able to leverage um, the calm stats, uh, the compression algorithms, the uh, snappy codec, yada, yada, yada. So all of that's basically put in place. So this is this makes your life easier and your reliance on the NoSQL store has reduced, um, not so much on functionality, but so much on cost. <laughs> like you're able to reduce the cost that's, that you, because you no longer have to throw that much concurrency on the NoSQL store. Exactly. Like the NoSQL store is still doing a pretty good job on the transaction. Right, 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 right. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah it's good, doing good what it's good at doing. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, we, we were kind of hacking it or trying to use it for our own needs and uh, what do you say, uh, our own timeline. <laughs> we're trying to fit our timeline with the solution. Right. So, uh, but now we don't, we can, we have two systems which can be kept in sync. We know that. Right. And each of them do what they do best. So that's kind of right. That's out there. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it goes back to the idea of like choosing the right tool for the job, right? And right, the things right. that I've definitely done this in the past, where I've used NoSQL stores, I've tried to basically do <laughs> operational type queries on that. And it, like for the occasional one, it actually makes a lot of sense too, because if you need it immediately, because like for example, you're debugging something, and you need it, it's a customer scenario where like you, like we haven't even transformed the data yet. We're just simply trying to like, hey, oh no, we need to deal with it right away because we got a debug call that's within the last like six hours. Yeah, yeah, go query it. It's a little expensive, but considering it's a premium customer, yeah, yeah, we don't care about the expense of this particular case, right? But then the idea of applying that for like, let's do that for everything. I'm like, no, like no. That, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, the, the concurrency cost alone is going to basically kill you. Yeah. True. So, um, oh, actually related to this, there's a great question on LinkedIn. And actually I'll pose that question right now. Uh, you did, I believe I'm saying your name correctly. And I apologize if I'm not, uh, ask the questions, uh, how can we do a hash comparison for finding the new changes? And so in this case, he's trying to understand better, like the, the new changes, because I think there's, there's two concepts that we want to talk about. There's the new changes that went from the hot store into Delta Lake, which is the hash comparison. So we'll talk about that uh, a little bit, but then there's also the downstream systems, which are actually picking backing off the CDF for from Delta Lake. So I'll answer the latter one just because that's straightforward. Like for the latter part, basically change data feed is an option directly within Delta Lake. Delta Lake itself has its own transaction log anyway. So by definition, all we did was really uh, make it available. And so that way it became really easy for you to go ahead and understand what were the changes that happened to the Delta Lake directly. That's why Yesh was able to talk about like the, the incrementalized views or things of that nature, like because you're able to, sh or the notifications go with it because it's you, you basically have that information right directly in the CDF. The question basically then is more a matter that I'll have you answer you to, is about like the hashed replica between, and it looks like my video's frozen, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm like, wow, I look really weird right now. But okay, uh, is to basically go ahead and do the replica between um, uh, the hot store and the um, uh, Delta Lake. Right, so, no, that's a good question. So, and this is something that we have spent a good amount of time and we have an, an individual work stream dedicated collaborating with Adobe Research just on this. So there are multiple answers to it, but I'll kind of give you the, the more simple version of what we're doing, the naive version. So think of okay, it as please. like every, so from e even from the hot store point of view, right? We have indices on a bunch of columns. One of the columns that you have an implicit in the indice indice is the primary key of whatever the document or whatever that we have is on. And the other is on the underscore TS or the internal timestamp of when that record or document was committed, right? So if I were to make a query to the hot store uh, to say, okay, give me all the documents that changed for this DB in the last, let's say 15 minutes, that is kind of, is a cheap query in terms of what, uh, as in, and then we also have like a, uh, a pseudo document hash that is kind of represented to indicate the content of the document itself uh, okay. in the hot store itself. So now that is also getting replicated, right? So now at regular intervals, we are able to query the hot store to say, give me all the hashes that have occurred in the past 15 minutes for a comparison. Mm. 
now you can look at Delta Lake and see like, okay, how many of these hashes have actually made it into the system? Got it. Think as in, you can think of this as an exact set match, or you can think of this like Jakarta similarity, but then your imagination, your imagination and your budget is your uh, lim 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 limit on this thing, right? Because you can throw a lot of computation. You can do exact matches too, depending on right, how right, much right, right. data yes. that you have. But we are right now at kind of like the terabytes a day, petabytes in total kind of a scale. So we try to optimize into more probabilistic techniques to say like, okay, we're probably okay with say like a 5% diff between this and this, but we need to make sure that all the data does progress into the system. So that's the verification process that we're doing, right? But apart from that, any data that gets into the CDC approach, we kind of maintain elaborate metadata on a source level so that we can track. So this entire replication process is keeping track of at every source. So we have every database has multiple sources hydrating into it. So on a per right. source level, we are maintaining counts and how many things are happening. So we see like, okay, you've got an input of say source one for let's say Adobe Analytics sent in 500 million records, uh, not 5 million records in the last 15 minutes. So now sure. we'll be able to know, okay, how much did the processor or the replication system also do. So that's more from a systems engineering point of view to keep track or like give some transparency on how much data flows. So we'll be able to measure it at that way. But then assuming the entire system is a black box and let's say the other thing is there. So we build this mechanism so that we can actually check uh, the, the, what is it, the strength of the replication process through this hash comparison. Got it, got it, got it. No, that's actually really cool. And it's a lot of work, I mean, to build systems like these, but I, I completely understand where you're coming from, especially from a systems operations perspective, where basically the replication itself, it's itself like basically, you're almost going to the point where like old school, like active, active, like clustering or active, active replication, where because, and the fact is like, yeah, you probably at some point, there are some points where you're doing exact match, but some points you're probably just only going to go bother with probabilistic just because of the nature of how much data you're processing. Correct. Right. right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, this is awesome, but I'm going to go switch because I just realized we only have about eight minutes left. Okay, so up to this point, we've talked about the replication. It's, it works great. We've talked about uh, how Delta Lake and has actually helped solve a lot of the problems because it, it simplified how the downstream systems were able to do it. You had the mapping function that made things easier. So that way the downstream systems didn't actually have to make many changes, if anything at all, for, uh, for them to be able to go ahead and still query the data. That's awesome. But there's got to be some problems. I mean, right up to this point, I mean, this, <laughs> basically, you, you, you made it almost like a great ad for Delta Lake. It's like, hey, okay, Delta right. Lake solves everything. We're good to go right away. So we know that's not true. And because this is a D3L2 session, we also wanted to call that out, right? We want to call out what were the problems that you saw within building these systems, even with how awesome Delta Lake is, and how were those solved? I'm just curious. <clears throat> no, okay, cool. That's uh... <laughs> that's definitely a tricky one. Okay, so in terms of problems, right? There are there were a lot of problems. There are still some problems which we'll figure out. But then in terms of if you look at the bigger ones, I think the underlying infrastructure. So Delta Lake gives you a good paradigm in terms of doing your upsurge, deletes, and all of that on top of packet data. But what people forget is you are bound by your by, by the performance of the underlying HDFS that you have, whether it's mm -hmm. S3, whether it's ADLS, as in the Azure Data Lake. So in the case of ADLS, like I was, I think I did say this before. We were earlier on Gen 1. Gen 1 did not scale. I think even Microsoft acknowledged that. Um, because there were a lot of limitations in terms of, you know, the number of metadata files, uh, as in the number of nodes that you can have within a given folder, et cetera. So once your table starts getting really, really big, you're, there's a lot of HDFS metadata operations happening from the Delta side, which will basically nuke your ADL as Gen 1. Thankfully, at the exact time that we started taking on uh, Delta Delta Lake, Gen 2 came up, right? Oh, perfect. Okay, Gen okay. 2 changed the game completely. Like in fact, okay. uh, unpopular opinion, right? But uh, Gen 2 in terms of Delta Lake support is better than S3 because in S3, you don't have the, uh, as an out of the box, the multi-cluster write. You actually need a coordinating database to make sure that you can write for multiple clusters. But on the ADLS Gen 2, you don't need to do that. 
So thanks. That's right. We didn't have to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. there was not yet another component that we needed to add to our infrastructure stack, right? So, but that was a problem for sure in terms of scaling out Gen two, um, be because people forget it's not oh I just did an operation on Delta it just worked. No, no, no. You have to definitely monitor your underlying uh, HDFS solution to see what throttling limits are there, what bandwidth limits are there, so that you can work around it or you can work with your cloud provider to make sure that you have some exceptions uh, uh, ahead in place. Um, so specifically like for that, for ADLS Gen 2, just to provide some context for folks, ADLS Gen 2 in all seriousness is basically the, the uh, Azure blob storage with a hierarchical store on top of it, with, with the option for hierarchical stores. And that actually often makes a lot of sense. So that's why we pretty much tell you, yeah, yeah, go do it. And so that's what basically what ADLS Gen 2. It provides an excessive amount of like scalability, but, and I'm pretty sure this is where the but is going to kick in. I, I take it that you had to basically work with the cloud provider, in this case, Azure, to basically make sure that, uh, and now when I use the word partitioning, I'm talking about the partitioning from the infrastructure, not from the data perspective, right? right. right? That you had to basically pre-allocate uh, the partitioning of, of ADLS Gen 2, or, or, or did they speed that up? Because in the past, now I'm literally using numbers from like years ago. In the past, it was something like you had to basically have uh, hit the threshold of like something like 5,000 or 10,000 IOPS uh, for a 24-hour period before they auto uh, partitioned underneath the covers. Is this something where you actually had to, uh, uh, you waited for that long or did you go ahead and pre -out? No, no, no. So the good thing about AP, it's a big enough team with a lot of different, I would say, expertise. So we, we have a dedicated team who is managing a lot of the data on the lake, as in the data lake. And they were sure. able to basically have a relationship with Microsoft to make sure all these pre-allocations happen ahead of time. Gotcha. So got it, got they it, took, care, it, took it. care of it. So there is a dedicated team kind of, you know, working behind the scenes to make sure that all these, the, the, the exact, the infra details that you're talking about are kind of nailed so that the rest of the system does not need to worry about it. So this is one of the advantages of being in the platform, being, uh, right. I would say, uh, grown from the bottom up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, this is, it's also good learning because the, a lot of folks don't know this, right? The, and so the fact is that you have a platform team that focuses on that, like it, it's analogous to like, you know, what I talked about in the past where like, when you're dealing with database systems, like you actually have to care about, like when this is before the cloud became such a big thing, right? you actually had to care about like the idea of random IOPS, right? How random IOPS, especially on spin disks would screw you over. So you actually had to understand the inf underlying infrastructure and recognize mm -hmm. that's why we told you all to use SSDs because it allowed you basically have random IOPS without any problem, right? So with cloud objects, cloud object store, yes, we abstracted that away. We said, yes, it's all just REST API calls for all intents and purposes that are against the cloud object store. But then all of a sudden cloud listings become notoriously slow as all heck. And to your point exactly, now you need to basically have people who are specialists who actually do understand how to work with the cloud providers to pre-allocate these things. Yeah. yeah, there's no free lunch. There is no exactly. Free lunch. Yeah, <laughs> it just shifted, or it's slightly different. But what's interesting is like the analogies are still similar. Like maybe the, the actual tech is right. is different now, but the analogies in, in terms of even stuff that we did like 20 years ago, still very much the same play. Okay, exactly. I realize that we only have a few minutes left. Okay, so I did want to call out though. Um, and I'm going to call myself out, okay, um, on this one. Delta Lake being the awesome, you had the infrastructure figured out, but there was a problem. Again, I'm going to call this out myself, that we hadn't open sourced enough of Delta Lake fast enough. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I actually sure. would, would love you to tell me how you beat us up so we could speed that up because that's completely correct. You did, and rightly so. I want to be very clear, rightly so. Right. So... The other problem that I was going to say was actually, yeah. we kind of got hooked onto Z ordering. Uh, yes, which, of So Z ordering, Z ordering. <laughs> yeah. So it was amazing because a lot of our workloads, like because I just talk about replication, right? And people think of sure. like, okay, you just replicated A to B. Fine. No, this replication consists of inserts, updates, and deletes, right? Right. You need to know how to do that efficiently so that that time bound that we're giving is not like hours, right? It can be minutes, but it cannot be hours. So the only right. way we were able to do that was, I think two important features that kind of made a thing was Z ordering was the one super important one. Another one was auto optimized, but Z ordering oh, sure. made a huge difference because we were kind of Z ordering based on a, a particular primary key, which we knew all our update statements 
or absurd statements were based on. Now, okay. the problem is the test came out really well, performance was really good, but then in terms of selling it to the rest of platform and upper management, it's like, oh, so you're going, so the entire business functionality or the performance hinges on a proprietary feature. Uh, that was a huge pain point, right? Because yes. you could say all the yada, yada, yada about Delta Lake and then you'll be like, oh, by the way, we are dependent. Oh, and it's open source. Oh, but by the way, we are dependent on this uh, proprietary feature from, da from Databricks that we love, by the way, but it's a risk that we need to go ahead with, right? Yeah. Because any organization, right, it has a combination of risk covers versus risk taking. So how do you rationalize it? That was a problem. So then mm -hmm. <laughs> after a lot of talking with Databricks, uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussions and trying to rationalize it, I was super happy that you guys actually just said like, okay, fine, let's go full open source. Let's just open source this. And, yes. and that, I would say that was a big thing, mainly because one, it was like internally we had the results and everything showing up, but then there was this thing that, code cannot change, right? right. Uh, you can't write enough code to get around a situation like this. So it right. kind of was good to have like a working and willing partner to say like, okay, fine, we, we got this, we, we hear you and we'll get that change. So I really appreciate that part. No, no, that's awesome. And incidentally, we were actually trying to figure out if we could do it even earlier than 2.0, but as you can tell, we actually had a bunch of the column stats stuff that we actually had to do first before, and the cluster we had to do before we could get the Z order out. That's why it took us to Delta 2.0 to do it. And to be very clear, it wasn't just Adobe asking. I, I do want to give Yes a ton of call outs here, but it, this was a definitely an ask by the community. So in prototypical fashion, like this is where customer and community were extremely aligned. Like there are times, obviously, that the two won't be aligned, right? But in many cases, especially when it comes to Delta, like the customers and computer are extremely aligned. So we're like, okay, cool. Well, like we heard you, we listened, and we just went ahead and did it. And I think you also called out like um, you needed open source, if for no other reason, also for local development, right? If I want to compile and run those code bases on my local machine, you're not running a Databricks cluster <laughs> on your on your your MacBook Air. <laughs> Right. That will never sell, right? As in, we right, have exactly. so yeah. many hundreds of developers. It will be like, okay, fine. Oh, by the way, you want to test something? Oh, you want to build something? Oh, it has Z order in it, which will now be a part of every single thing because this is in the hub. Oh, by the way, go do it in Databricks. No, that's not, yeah. that's not, it's not yeah. going to happen. Uh, no, yeah. no, you'll have to, what to say, fry IntelliJ and VS Code or whatever from all yeah. our... <laughs> No, no, it, it, we, we've, we've, we've tried to make it easier, which is like basically, by the way, just as a call shout out, like with uh, Apache Spark 3.4, we're including Spark Connect. And Spark Connect and Databricks Connect uh, basically are the same thing. Just Databricks Connect has um, authentication authorization stuff that's specific to Databricks. Otherwise, it's the exact same code base. Um, and so the idea is that you could presumably from your ID, from your VS code, write the code and actually submit it directly to Databricks cluster. But even with me saying that, you and I are on the same page. No, you're going to pry the development out of my cold, dead hands, right? right? No, I need to run this stuff locally first before I do anything. Yeah. So sure. um, so we only have a few minutes left, but I did want to leave off with a cool tidbit. You had told me this when we had chatted before about exactly how much easier from a manageability perspective, like in terms of the number of tables and the number of tenants, that your team actually has to manage. So why don't you tell the, the audience here, <laughs> like with your team, how, mon, how much are you managing? And like, and that's why Delta Lake actually ends up becoming this awesome thing for you guys. Right, so if you think about it, right, I think we have close to, I'm not gonna get attendance, but in terms of a sheer number, I say close mm -hmm. to 5,000 to 6,000 Delta tables right now and actively okay. growing. So. Usually when people talk about the migration, it's like you have one big fat table, which you basically split into probably two, three in terms of making it a good alignment. But in this case, we have internal clients, external clients and all that. When you put a total number in, we have close to 5,000 to 6,000 tables, Delta tables that we're actively replicating to fanning out uh, to uh, at a regular basis, right? In a real time basis. So now mm -hmm. maintaining that and everything has become is actually pretty easy, contrary to what people might think, because we just have one huge maintenance job that runs 
and all it does is in, it takes care of orchestrating the vacuums, optimize, and everything. So everything is broken down, right? Like if you even had a Postgres sure. DB, you still had to sometimes schedule your vacuums and stuff like that. Yeah, what yeah. we did is we basically understand we are basically running a database on demand, like compute on demand for a database. That is what we are managing. Right. right? That's that is the acknowledgement that we have to make, and that right. we have to take care of all these maintenance operations ourselves. So from our side, we already have a good orchestration system that can parallelize, which is again, just compute on Databricks and sure. the Spark cluster. So we've just managed that. And the rest of the operations in terms of the vacuum, optimize and everything, as long as we have awareness on what it's doing, you schedule it and you're good to go. Your tables are fine. Uh, of course, I say this very easily, but then as long as you read the docs and you understand the concurrency conflicts and everything that happens, uh, that's a separate talk of its own. But as long as you do that, you should be gold golden to manage how many other databases that you want. Uh, we have learned a lot of lessons from Maname and Manman and managing multiple ten tenants before. So a lot of them came into what to say came handy at this time. Perfect. Um, yes. Uh... This is excellent. Uh, I think this is a great way for us to end today's session. Uh, if you do have any questions or want to chat a little bit more, uh, we will we'll be updating this. By the way, we'll, there'll be a, a follow-up blog that we'll be writing together uh, on this topic as well, uh, based basically on this conversation that we're having today. Uh, this the video is already uh, being live streamed to both LinkedIn and YouTube, so you can already see us there. But just as importantly, go to go.delta.io slash Slack. A bunch of us are already there answering questions as well. So um that that's really it yes anything else that you want to add potentially add um no i can keep going on all day <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah I'm, i figured I'm, as much which is why i wanted to time <laughs> it but uh, no really yes i really appreciate your time this is super insightful super helpful i'm really glad there's a lot of really cool lessons learned for the community but then like i said yeah if you want to continue chatting or you have specifics that maybe be worthwhile for us to have a follow-up uh, either session or follow-up blog on uh yeah just join us at go.delta.io slash slack so with that, Yesh, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you, everybody.